we've been discussing over the last two days is uh, is the use of humor. Um, you know, we are, uh, I think, because of the news and, and um, you know, more and more uh, our history is beginning to be talked about um, and often it's, it's the dark uh, side of our history and um, Louise Half has spoken before about the need to um, to open those wounds so that they can uh, be, be cleared um, for real, and uh, a part of that uh, is through humor. And so I just at this point want to acknowledge other writers that we've had uh, do readings both last night and uh, throughout the last two days. Um, as I mentioned, these have uh, read last night. Um, Marie, uh, AKA, um, also known as Marie Anhard Baker, um, who uh, showed us the, uh, the power that, uh, that humor can take um, the form of. And uh, we also had uh, Armand Garnet Rufo uh, read last night as well. Um, and Joan Crate, who, uh, who read this afternoon. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, those writers and say how uh, honored we are to, uh, to have you with us as well. Um, her next writer is uh, Marilyn Dumont. Uh, she is a Métis poet whose first collection, A Really Good Brown Girl, uh, in 1996, won the Gerald Lampert Award for the best first book of Canadian poetry. Her second collection, Green Girl Dreams Mountains, won both the 2001 Alberta Book Award for Poetry, and her third collection, That Tongue Belonging, was awarded the 2007 Anscock Aboriginal Poetry Book of the Year, and also the Anscock Aboriginal Book of the Year. Um, Marilyn Dumont has been the writer in residence at the Universities of Alberta and Windsor and at Grant McEwen Community College in Edmonton and Massey College, University of Toronto. She teaches creative writing at Athabasca, so please join me in welcoming her. Tash is one of those beautifully tall Cree. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start with um, an old, old poem called The Devil's Language. And um, this was something that I wrote when I was doing an undergrad in English. I'm just going to put my, my watch up here so I can keep track of the time. The Devil's Language. Um, I grew up in a home where Cree was spoken although my parents didn't want us to, um, I don't know if they didn't want us to learn Cree, they wanted us to not have a Cree accent, I think, um, and to speak English, because we lived in a small, non-native um, town. Sorry, I just have to find this. devil's language. I have since reconsidered Eliot and the great white way of writing English, standard that is. The great white way has measured, judged, and assessed me all my life. By its lily white words, its picket fence sentences, and manicured paragraphs, one wrong sound in your shelf in the native literature section. Resistance writing, a mad Indian, unpredictable on the warpath. Native ethnic protest. The great white way could silence us all if we let it. It's had its hand over my mouth since my first day of school, since Dick and Jane ABCs and fingernail checks. Syntactic laws use the wrong order or register and you're a dumb Indian. Dumb, drunk, or violent. My father doesn't read or write the king's English and he says he's dumb, but he speaks Cree. How many of you speak Cree? Correct Cree, 
not correct English? Grammatically correct Cree. Is there one? Is there a received pronunciation of Cree, a modern Cree usage? The chief's Cree, not the king's English, as if violating God the Father and standard English is like talking backwards, as if speaking the devil's language is talking back, back words, back to your mother's sound, your mother's tongue, your mother's language, back to the clearing in the bush, in the tall black spruce, near the sound of horses and wind, where you sat on her knee in a canvas tent, and she fed you bannock and tea and syllables that echo in your mind now. Now that you can't make the sound of that voice that rocks you and sings you to sleep, devil's language. <laughs> um, we were in one of our circles today, I think it was today or maybe it was yesterday, the forest fund maker was talking about um, teaching English. I don't know if forest is here or not, but anyways, this is, um, this is for forest. Um, and what happened to me when I ended up teaching English to um, students at the Native Education Center in Vancouver? It's called Straw Boss. I strut the glassy classroom floor in ink black cowboy boots, for I am the English teacher in the classroom of Sioux, Soto, and Cree speakers. I'm the head honcho grammarian riding the range, looking to lasso comma splices, cut fragments away from the herd, corral faulty logic, run-ons and brand, incorrect subject verb agreement, X, S, V. I am the straw boss in the stable of grammatical errors, and I'm gonna break those wild ponies and turn them into the sweetest little filly sentences you'd ever sing to the saddle <laughs> I should mention. 
Lynch in Rutherford. Um, Elizabeth Brass Donald's husband worked for the Hudson's Bay and uh, he was awarded some land in Edmonton where the New Tart uh, Conservatory sits on now. And that land actually ended up, um, they lost that land, but the land ended up in the name of Premier Rutherford. Um, I wonder how that happened. Mm -hmm. And um, another name is uh, Strath Lord Strathcona, who speculated on uh, Métis land script and um, became a very, very wealthy man. Um, and studies at the University of Alberta has shown that of the script land that was um, awarded to Métis people, there's only about 2 or 3 percent that actually stayed in Métis hands. So this is entitled, The Land She Came From. Cree woman crow, Cree woman caw, black shiny bird woman, crow and caw, those who command you go back to the land you came from. So shiny black bird woman plants herself in front of Frank Oliver's house, has her photograph snapped in 1885, her image singed into his pupils, into the inky black and white pages of his bulletin, the official but negative space in Edmonton's story, not the other story of Métis river lots severed into city blocks. A quarter for a Métis river lot, Crow knows what was what when it all went wrong. Cree woman Crow, Cree woman Ka, call out those names. Ka, 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 Rutherford. Call out those names, names that now mysteriously bear title to land once granted your husband. His reward for 30 years HBC service as carpenter and blacksmith. A quarter for a half-breed lot. Crow knows what was what when it all went wrong. Cree woman crow, Cree woman caw. Crow and caw names of those known as better men when Indians couldn't own land. Call out their names. Caw! Ka, Ka, Oliver, stand iron-fisted before his two-story red brick house rising civil in the background. A quarter for a Métis river lot, Crow knows what was what when it all went wrong. Cree woman Crow, Cree woman Ka, Crow woman dig down, scrape away the layers of sleeping memory, down to the state lines of river lots in Rossdale and beyond, far down to the Métis family names still breathing there, Donald, Bird, Ward, push away the topsoil, sand and silt to names Daniel, Charland, Gladue, Uncover their stories of migration to build and supply Beaver Hill's house before it all went wrong. Uncover the names of profiteers, Lord Strathcona for one, snapping up script and reserve land for the price of a sack of groceries. When Papa's chase people were starving and deprived of rations. Recite his name, Papa's chase. Papa's chase, Papa's chase, so it won't wash away in the flood of progress. And I'll just finish up with this um, last poem. Um, my mother used to do beadwork, and I used to look at it, and look, watch her do it, and I'd think, oh my God. And I was a teenager, and I'm thinking, how could she stand doing that tedious stuff? And then, um, years later in Edmonton, um, I asked my friend Gregory Schofield to uh, you know, show me how to do beadwork. And so he reminded me of all of those times, and I had, and uh, all of those times that I watched, watched my mom do beadwork. So this is a poem about, uh, on one level, about beadwork. 
entitled, And With Second Sight, She Pushes. <laughs> I should maybe just mention, um, for people who are not familiar with doing beadwork, that for some beadwork you do with two needles, uh, one needle you string the beads on, and the other needle and thread you pull up and just uh, sew, I sew down every bead. Um, but some people do two, three, whatever. Um, and with second sight, she pushes. Sitting close to light, falling through a window, glancing down a needle along a thread to the center of a bright bead, is her belief in petal, stem, and leaf. She directs a long, thin needle, picks one tiny seed bead after seed bead after seed from a saucer, until she has drawn a long white string with her fingers at the end of a needle. Her fingers nudge their seeds side by side, looping their weight into a petal, laid flat against the fabric nap, each seed pressed against the cloth by the thumb and forefinger of her left hand while the thumb and forefinger of her right plumb the unseen side of the fabric with another needle and thread. And with second sight, she pushes the needle and thread up precisely where her eye wants to meet it on the surface of the fabric. Then down between each bead by seed, bead, seed, over and over repeated this gesture of petal makes patient shape. The bead's color makes no sound, but its color is cranberry, moss, and fireweed. It is also wolf willow, sap, and sawdust, as well as chickadee, magpie, and jackrabbit. A bead is not simply dark blue, but Saskatoon blue, and it is not merely black but beaverhead black. And it is not just a seed bead. It's a number 11 pearlized bead, or a number 10 two-cut glass bead, or a number 10 French white heart. The fabric weightless, supple through her lissom fingers, the wax thread yielding, and the bright beads obedient as good children, lining up in straight rows inside the white outline of a petal. But as she shifts to light falling on her beadwork, her thoughts turn to stem, how it attaches to petal and leaf. Slim stem, but bloodline to root and back to leaf. And she the link like stem from rich root to sprouting leaf, her children. She, this link, holds each bead berry a, th a thought each bead berry a word in prayer for her son, for her daughter, for her grandchild. She considers blue beads as holding a piece of the sky reflected in berries. Her same fingers gather saskatoons draping from branches and blue with fruit and releases them to the lard pail tied to her waist. They're dropping the sound of small drumming in the pail. Her same fingers scoop saskatoons, the fruit of feasts, from a bowl in the sweat, that place of gathering self and others back to womb, that bulb of life in her mother. Each bead of birth she senses as light grows faint as thread. Each bead of birth she sees her eyesight fine as thread. Each bead a birth, she listens. Each bead sewn down, a word.